um, you're a socialist of sorts. Do you yeah. see it in any way positive that the left should interact with like libertarians or conservatives to try to get things done? Because you're one of those guys who goes out there and speaks to everybody. You know, I have been raising the alarm about libertarianism and and how it is an ideological danger, uh, you know, for a long time. When I was in college, I was interested in socialism and Marxism and all of that. And I would meet, you know, there are people that I went to college with who are the most normal, straight-laced, conservative, Republican, evangelical conservatives, never had a dissident thought, supported every war, supported everything. And then one day they would wake up and they would say, you know, the wars are wrong. You know, uh, the government is lying to us. And they would wake up and say, and the problem is we don't have real capitalism. And the problem is America is a communist country already and we need to restore the republic. And I, I mean, and I saw this and it made my head spin because I'm here saying, yes, the wars are wrong. Yes, the government is full of lies. And that's because it's run by billionaires and bankers. And we need an economy that serves the people where the banks, factories and industries are organized to serve public good and not profits. We need society to control the means of production. I was, I was a Marxist. And so when I saw people waking up, but waking up wrong, I, I said that something needs to be done about this. We need to address this. And the answer I got from so many leftists was, no, no, just build the movement. You know, let's just build our little peace rallies or whatever. Let's focus on doing our own thing. Whatever the Democrats are doing, we just do it slightly louder and, and that'll address it. And I said, no, there's a real problem here. And look, the reality is all across the United States, there are millions of people in red states and even in some blue states who they wake up, uh, they realize the government is lying. They realize that, that you know we're being, having our civil liberties stripped away, but there is no Marxist or leftist uh, voice there to point them to ideologically towards socialism. Uh, instead, you know, their responses, I mean, it's the natural response. They're, they're, the right wing ideology is out there. So they turn to right wing libertarian and paleo conservative views to explain the crisis. Well, the answer is we need to get to these people, refute their arguments, uh, win them to socialism. The answer is not to just cancel these people, to just say you're a Nazi, you're Scott. I mean, it's like at first uh, it seemed the left was unconcerned about this rising ideological threat. Then now their response to it is just this childlike castigation, cancel culture, and these yeah. people all become deplorables. And it's like, no, there is a real issue here. Let's talk about ideology. Let's find out what these people believe, where we share common views, but also where they are dead wrong. I, I, I mean, this is just basic. I mean, when it comes to ideology, some people have one ideology, you have your ideology, you engage with them and promote your own views. And maybe you learn something in the process. This is pretty basic politics, but it seems like so much of what the left is doing in our time is just defending the status quo from right-wing opposition. That's really what it's gotten down to. That, that the, the right wing in this country is far more well established, deep roots in communities, the John Birch Society, conservative, paleo. I mean, there's a, there's a huge right wing apparatus and the mainstream of the establishment is threatened by it. So the left, we're just supposed to be their useful idiots and go along with them and kind of securing the status quo from this right wing opposition. Well, this right wing opposition is wrong and doesn't have the answers, but the status quo is wrong and failing. And that's why this right wing opposition is growing. The answer is a left alternative, but that has been forgotten. And this cancel culture atmosphere, this shrill, I mean, it's almost like people are being trained to believe that if you actually are a leftist, that makes you on the right. Um, right. It's like it's like there is no left wing criticism of the status quo being tolerated. It's very scary. Can I follow up? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, well, I want to touch on that a little bit more because I consider myself a leftist libertarian. And the only reason why I say that is because I don't believe in the fiscal policies of a libertarian. You know, I, I, I tend to lean more towards the socialist policies about, you know, uh, you know, we're on Rockfin right now. It's a co-op and I love it. I think it's one of the greatest things out there. Uh, and I want workers, when I hear people say communism, I don't get like my mom or my aunt where they go, oh my God, communism. I think like workers' rights and I think socialism is social safety nets. But the political left, and including a lot of DSA members and the DSA uh, mechanisms itself, they have like this authoritarian uh, streak in them. And as a leftist libertarians, I feel right now in government, it's only the libertarians really that are protecting our civil liberties. And I think that's one of the most important things. They're one of the only uh, 
a group out there that is for is anti-regime change. They're like, you know, they don't want to invade any countries whatsoever. And they're like one of the only groups out there that are pushing for fair elections. So isn't there something that we can have? Because I've heard you say before, when America moves to its form of socialism, it's going to be its own, it's, it's certain brand of socialism. So isn't there something good to take out of the libertarian movement? Uh, I mean, look, I think libertarians have really tapped into kind of the motor mindedness of Americans. We have always been a country of entrepreneurs. We've always been a country of people who want to go out there and achieve their dreams and get something going. And that part of the reason the Eastern Bloc fell is that there was a, a strata in those societies, college professors, scientists, teachers, you know, who were just feeling stifled by the system. And, and that, uh, that it was by kind of hijacking the grievances of those individuals that the CIA and Brzezinski and Soros were able to kind of manipulate the unrest that brought down and, and led to the color revolutions that toppled the Eastern Bloc. Well, if you look at what China is doing right now, but also what Vietnam is doing, what Cuba is doing, and you go to Venezuela, Bolivia, they have a big market sector. People start their own businesses. They have their own restaurants and hotels and tech companies, et cetera. But at the same time, you have state central planning. You have you know, management of the economy to make sure that the irrationality of profits in command doesn't get out of control. And I think that, that I, a lot of libertarians, they're libertarian in the sense because they want to go out there. They want to achieve their dreams. They don't want to be stuck working in a government steel mill for the rest of their life. And so I can understand why, why it kind of takes hold. And I think we need to make clear that, that socialism is not about you know, making people poorer so it's fair. Socialism is about rationally organizing the economy so that growth is no longer restrained and human reason and human, pro human progress can be raised to, to higher levels than ever. That is, the, that is the goal of socialism. I mean, ultimately, the ultimate higher stage of communism that Karl Marx spoke about is only possible when there's a huge expansion of material wealth in the world. He talks about a, a world where there is, there is so much wealth that exists that people only work because they feel like working. Uh, you know, where, where you can live according to each according to his own ability, each according to their needs, right? I mean, and this is based on a high level of material abundance. And I, I think that that understanding, if people could get that, if we can organize the economy rationally, I mean, the problem with capitalism is that in capitalism, abundance creates poverty. In systems of the past, people were hungry because there wasn't enough food. Well, now under capitalism, people are hungry because there's too much food. In the past, people were homeless because there wasn't enough housing. Well, capitalism creates a situation where people are homeless because there's too much housing. That's what happened in 2008 when the housing bubble burst. There were houses everywhere and people couldn't afford to keep buying them. And the, the mortgage ripoff schemes from Alan Greenspan only worked out so longer. And people, you know, I remember 2008, 2009, there were tent cities, all kinds of people across the United States after the economy crashed became homeless because there's too much housing. That is, that is not a rational system. And that's capitalism. And that's the irrationality of profits running your economy. The banking system, the healthcare, you know, the, the major centers of economic power, your major oil well, your, you know, your major natural resources, these things should be public property so that we can strategically plan out the economy so that growth is no longer held back by this insane boom bust cycle of, of the economy and, and technology can advance and human prosperity can advance at the same time. We don't kill jobs uh, by inventing more efficient ways to produce things. I mean, this is the Marxist vision. This is what Marx talked about in Capital. Um, you know, there's this crude understanding of what socialism is that we all get in school, that socialism is when the government divides up everything equally so it's fair. And that, that's just ridiculous, right? That, that socialism is about, you know, the means of production, the centers of economic power being controlled by society so that human reason and growth can greatly expand. Yeah, I think a lot of the fear that comes from Americans who haven't been exposed to socialism is the authoritarian streak that they feel like is going to take over big central government. I think that the, there's that line where, you know, people like uh, draw like I consider myself pretty like very, very far left. But also I don't want uh, people infringing on, you know, privacy, on, on censorship, on on any of these things. But the, the, the thing is that is possible under socialism. It's just people haven't been exposed. They, they've gotten socialism from the a very whitewashed uh, version that is, is not really accurate. Would you say that uh, organizations like DSA hurt or actually help 
the idea of, of socialism? Well, it's kind of a mixed bag. OK, um, well, let's just talk about where DSA came from. OK, I think it's really important to talk about that. Michael Harrington, uh, who was somebody who served in the administrations of Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy. Uh, he was a good friend of a guy named Max Schachtman, uh, who ended up working with the CIA. And, you know, there, you know when DSA was started uh, in the 1970s, uh, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, there were all kinds of deep state connected people involved in it. Gloria Steinem, right, the voice of feminism in the 1970s, she brags in her autobiography about how her career started with the CIA and the Central Intelligence Agency. And that, that basically what was happening in the 1970s was there was a huge upsurge of radical and anti-imperialist and anti-war feeling. And that the DSA represented a wing of the American deep state that shared some of those sentiments, but also wanted to control some of those sentiments and keep them from going towards sympathy with China or the Soviet Union or, or you know, communist countries. So DSA DSA was kind of set up and it has roots and ties to the intelligence apparatus of the United States. That said, though, there are a lot of great people in DSA. I mean, I have friends who are in DSA and if I, I'm a journalist, I cannot join any political organization because that would hinder my objectivity. But if I were not, I might join the DSA just because it would be a great place to meet people um, and to talk to people and engage with people about socialism. I think that probably the biggest problem with the DSA, in my view, is that it's kind of changed the definition of socialism to uh, the socialism is the government giving people free stuff, right? Uh, so, and that's not what socialism is. I mean, you know, um, every country in the world has some form of wealth redistribution. I mean, there's, there's roads outside of the building I'm in. Those roads were built by money that was redistributed from, uh, from people like me who pay our taxes, right? That doesn't mean New York City is a socialist country. Um, you know, that there's some level of wealth redistribution, government providing services in every country and always has been. Socialism is a whole new economic system where profits are not in command. Um, and, and I think that that understanding has been lost. And, and I, I'm kind of disappointed that DSA has done that. Um, it seems like, you know, the Tea Party, they accused Barack Obama of being a socialist and said, Barack Obama wants to tax and spend. He wants to tax you and give people free stuff with your money. And the DSA seems to have said, yep, that's what socialism is. And that's a good thing. Well, that's not what socialism is. That's something that right. goes on in every society. Yeah, I, I'm going to need you to come join some of my Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> in New York when I get out there, man, because we start having to talk about this subject and I just get my ass kicked. Yeah. I got a lot of conservative uh, family members out there.